Tonight, the farming methods that make chicken so cheap. The supermarket meat that's not what it seems to be. That's well out of order. And why Chef Raymond Blanc turned his nose up at some supermarket ready meals. Oh, my God. That, to me, that's a crime against humanity. The supermarket's high street stranglehold is changing the way we eat as well as shop. Tonight, we take a trolley down the aisles to lift the lid on some supermarket secrets. an integral part of family life, the weekly trip to the supermarket for the family food shop. The major supermarket chains seem to have grown into a kind of shopper's paradise. Cheap food perfectly presented, a range and variety that would have been undreamt of 50 years ago. So what's the problem? I'm a working journalist with three kids and as far as I'm concerned, my local supermarket is a godsend. I can pick up all of the food I want in a single trip. And what's more, it's all top quality stuff and cheap too. Well, at least that's what the supermarkets would have us believe. Sunday lunch, 1950s style. Mr and Mrs Average Britain sit down with the kids to an extra special treat, a nice bit of chicken, roast potatoes and two seasonal veg. Dominic. Fast forward 50 years and that chicken has magically transformed from an expensive treat into Britain's staple diet. But now it's likely to be pre-packed, pre-prepared and ready to eat. And we're eating four times as many chickens as 30 years ago. Or to put it another way, literally billions of thighs, breast, wings and drumsticks. Chicken tikka masalas, chicken kievs, chicken pies, chicken escallops, chicken nuggets, chicken goujons and southern fried chicken. But there's a price to pay for all this cheap food and it's not just a financial one. I've come deep into the rural heart of England to visit a highly successful ultra-modern business. Hello. Hello, Jane. How are you? Very pleased to meet you. Nice to see you. Alan Simpson has built a facility which uses the most up-to-date technologies available. It's well run and super efficient. It's uh, one of the largest independent units in the UK. It doesn't look like something I would traditionally call a farm. No, I think it's moved a long way from the early days. We have unfortunately, and I hate to use the word, you know, become a factory farm, but that's exactly what we are. We're, yeah. we're factory farming. His farm produces over two million units every year. Most of them end up on supermarket shelves in the fresh meat aisles. Alan Simpson grows chickens the modern way. So this is all pretty high tech. What does this all do? Is it temperature? Um, all the houses are, the environment is controlled. Daily temperatures, uh, the lighting patterns, how much ventilation the, the bird receives. It takes care of it all, all by computer. Okay. Now then, before we go in there, uh -huh. I must ask you, no um, quick movements. Right. You are going to find this something different than you've seen before. So I'm asking you not to be uh, too alarmed by it. If you move quietly, the birds will simply become adjusted to you. Okay, you've got me worried now, Alan. No, 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 no. It's, but you don't start any sharp movements to start. Right. Okay, just let, just let them. Are you going to go get used to it? <gasps> oh, oh my no. God! <gasps> Come on. As far as my eye can see, I can see chickens. My God. It's a good job I'm not frightened of birds. I've just stepped into the middle of twenty-five thousand of them. So is this sort of like the legal maximum of birds that you're allowed to have in uh, a no, space no, like no, this? No, no, no. We can grow chicken to a lot denser 
um, volume on the floor than this. Denser um, than this? Oh yes, this is, this is what I'm happy with. There's more room for them to move around and uh, I, I'm personally just happier growing to 34 kilos a metre than the 38 kilos a metre that we're allowed. But not everyone can afford to be as scrupulous as Alan Simpson. Unfortunately in our industry, there's a lot of people put these nice new buildings up, they've got to pay their loans back and they, and they can't afford to grow them like this. And there's a fine line between them having their own space and having very little space. And a lot of my colleagues believe that if they would all grow chicken like this if only they could get a just return for it. As chicken gets cheaper, turnover grows. Alan Simpson now has up to a third of a million birds in the sheds at any one time. There's, there's been a demand for cheap food, and then you get in the situation where, where they find out that, oh, well, they can now produce it for a little bit less, and, and, you, and you get driven down. The price just gets driven down. This is a hell of a lot of chickens. When I go into my supermarket, I pay, say, an average of three quid, maybe, for a chicken. Somebody's making a fortune. The baby chick is about 26p. The food that we feed it is um, 64p. Uh, your ongoings, heat, wages and all the other bits and pieces are about 16. Your processor probably works on about 50 pence a kilo. That leaves, yeah, that leaves us with 4p. So you, so We're left make, with 4p. So you personally make 4 pence per chicken? Yeah, it's a meagre amount for, for, uh, for what we have invested here. With farmers turning over millions of birds every year at just four pence a bird, it's vital to ensure that standards are kept high. So five years ago, the supermarkets and the poultry industry got together to launch the Assured Chicken Production Standards Scheme. Inspectors are supposed to make regular farm visits, even if they're pre-arranged. And if this red tractor logo is on a chicken on the supermarket shelves, it should mean that conditions in the broiler house have reached the proper standard. And this is all the more important because modern intensive farming techniques have turned chicken rearing into an industrial process. These chicks are a breed called Ross 308. Sounds like a sports car, but in fact, it's the supermarket's favorite chicken because it fattens up fast. If you're eating chicken from a supermarket this evening, chances are it'll be a Ross 308. Once these baby chicks start tucking into their specially developed high protein feed, a modern broiler farm can grow a chick from this to this in just 42 days. And that means that these little chicks will fast forward through life, reaching maturity in just about half the time it took their 1950s forebears. But what does all that do for the taste of supermarket chicken? Mm. Bland is about the best you can say, really. But that's a problem that doesn't just go for chicken. How does supermarket meat stand up against the traditional butcher? Chadwick's in Wigan is as traditional as they come. It's an old fashioned high street butcher's where meat has been prepared the same way for decades the kind of place the supermarkets have been putting out of business. I believe that we should produce good food to the best of our knowledge for the benefit of our customer. I pay the farmers as much as I can. I charge the customers as little as I can. And in between, I try to make as much money as I can. <laughs> but we will not sell anything that we don't think's fit. So what does John Chadwick think of the kind of meat on sale in the supermarkets? We asked him to cast an expert eye over a selection of packaged meat we bought in his local supermarkets. Uh, right, what else have we got? New season's lamb, yeah, no problems with that. In there, we've got one, two, three, four loin chops and two cut chops pretending to be loin chops. Whoa. That's well out of order. 
Cutlets passing themselves off as loin chops. Shame on you, Asda. Whatever next. Asda told us one man's cutlet is another man's loin chop. Our loin chop packs, they said, include loin chops from the rib end, also known as cutlets. The National Federation of Meat and Food Traders disagree. Their spokesman told us a traditional loin chop should have a T-bone in it, unlike a cutlet. All right, let's move on. We've got two nice pork chops. Oh, it isn't. When I read the label, it's with added water for extra succulents. Why adulterate a natural product? What else has gone in with the water? If you read the small print, there's all sorts gone in it. Dry glucose syrup, stabilizers, and preservatives. Why? It's a natural product. It'll keep. I don't understand. And with a pack price of £2.20, you're paying 25 pence for all that water, glucose, stabilizers, and preservatives. According to Tesco, because customers now prefer grilling to frying, a brine solution is added to some pork cuts, because otherwise they would lose some succulents. We've got another one. Oh, it's a cracker, this one. We've got the natural fat there, and we've got some added fat there. That means you've got animals from more than one beast. Bad butchery. If I look at mine, all I have is natural fat. If you buy mine, you buy more meat, less fat. Uh, in price, I'm actually a little bit cheaper, about 20 pence a kilo cheaper. Tesco told us... Added fat produces a more succulent joint. We also sell joints without added fat. So the supermarkets can't always beat the traditional butcher on price. But what about taste? decided to put a range of supermarket meat to the taste test. And here's a place where exquisite taste and top quality ingredients are very much on the menu. Raymond Blanc's award-winning Le Manoir au Quatre Saisons. We invited a bunch of average shoppers from the Oxford area to join us there. And like most of the rest of us, they now do the bulk of their shopping in supermarkets. Tesco's and Sainsbury's, they're the local ones. As to for cheapness. I can sort of walk five minutes down my road and there's a Sainsbury's local. Today they've volunteered to help us with our tasting. Sadly though, it won't be the confit of foie gras with soused cherries and spiced mango chutney. No, they're here to see if they can tell the difference between lamb and steak brought in a supermarket and the same meat bought from Raymond Blanc's favourite butcher. So what do you have for me? That one is a Devonshire or Suffolk or Devonshire lamb. Oh, lovely. Are, uh, are nice. lovely. The texture Absolutely. on them is nice and soft. Yeah. But first, our jury of twelve are about to pass judgment on two sirloin steaks. They'll have nothing to go on but texture and taste. Yeah, that's a lot of eyes lighting up there. And to make life more difficult, they've both been cooked by the man himself. Uh, the two different types are one that's from the supermarket and then the other one bought from the sort of traditional butchers. They don't know which is which, but it's the butcher's sirloin up first. Meat number one, traditional butcher's prime sirloin. I really like that, actually. Lovely smell. Really firm texture. Juicy. Very, very nice. I thought it was very juicy, which I thought was very good. Got a, lot, got a lot of taste straight off. OK, great. Well, uh... And now it's the supermarket steak. Here we go. You always get to go first. You're very lucky, yeah. aren't you? Meat number two, Morrison's top quality sirloin steak. The first one was more uniform. This is a bit messy in the way. But it had quite a sort of buttery flavour, but it still wasn't as... Um, it wasn't as pleasing as the first one. So, first of all, who preferred... Sirloin steak number one. Wow, this looks like a clear-cut verdict. Oh, OK, ten. And ten. who preferred steak number two? Not looking good for Morrison's. 
So this looks like first blood to Monsieur Blanc. In fact, it's a 10-2 verdict in favour of the butcher's beef and against the supermarket sirloin. You. Thank you. Thank you, panel. <laughs> Thank you, team. Thank you, team. You've made him very happy. <laughs> Next, it's lamb. And this time, we'll make it just a little more difficult. Blindfolds on, everyone. Thank you very much. Very serious. They've got to do the job on taste alone. No clues from what it looks like this time. And also, just to make the point that um, in all of the stuff that we've been buying, when we've been to the supermarkets, we've bought, you know, pretty much the best stuff that they have on offer. We've not sort of gone for the economy range of things, just so that you know that. We'll start from this end. Meat number one, Sainsbury's lamb chops. OK, and uh, if we could bring in lamb chop number two. Meat number two, traditional butcher's lamb chops. And who preferred lamb chop number two? Not quite unanimous, but another comfortable victory for the traditional butcher. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We're going to take a bit of a break now, and guess what? You can have something to eat. <laughs> A food tasting with Raymond Blanc is a pleasant way to find out about supermarket food. But in part two, I come face to face with the dark side of the meat industry. This is a chicken farm in Norfolk. Birds are reared here for one of the biggest suppliers of chickens to supermarkets across the country. Behind these doors are thousands of chickens. They've almost reached the end of their life cycle when they'll be slaughtered ready for eating. The conditions you are about to see are truly horrific. This film, shot by an undercover investigator just two months ago in May, is a chilling record of the way in which some chickens are being reared. Lameness is obvious. Birds unable to lift themselves out of the ammonia-soaked litter. But in amongst them, dead and injured birds, their companions sometimes trampling on them. It's absolutely boiling in here, stifling in here. The condition of some of these birds, badly injured but still alive, is deeply distressing. Yet many of them are likely simply to be slaughtered along with the rest. They won't make grade A, the whole chickens you find on the supermarket shelves, but when it comes to chicken pieces, the requirements are less demanding. We decided to show this film to Don Broom. He's Professor of Animal Welfare at Cambridge University. What we see here is a bird which is uh, splayed legs and is not able to stand up very well. It, I, every farmer should manage their bird so that no bird is in that situation where it uh, can't walk and is liable to be trampled on. And, you can and that also... one's just lost the will to live. Look, well, it's well, just sitting there. It can't right. move, it can't no. go anywhere. Well, that, that, that bird is, is in extremis. The welfare would be very poor indeed. It can't control what's happening to it. And uh, really, it needs to be taken out of that environment and uh, probably uh, killed. But th that, that's clearly not happening, because that bird hasn't just gone like... hasn't become like that, like that, has it? No, that's it's, right. Someone's not picking them out during the day. No, there would have been a period of several days to get to that point. See, let's just have a look. Now, that one, at first sight, looks like it's dead. But then if you look closely, just there at the back, it's still moving. Yes, it is. Now, so... that's, that, to me, looks like suffering. This is appalling. I, I mean, now, look, this is clearly dead. Yes, that's a bird which has um, probably been unable to walk and then has been trampled on by the others. And we're actually treating these chickens in a different way from the way we would treat a, a cow or a horse. We wouldn't do this to a cow or a horse, leave them there to be trampled to death. And, and uh, it does happen to chickens, and uh, clearly the welfare of the birds is very poor when that does happen. Well, if the bird is prevented from walking, then it's not going to be able to get to water uh, and, and indeed food, but it would die from dehydration uh, within a few days. So a bird which can't walk is going to die. But the other aspect of that is that if it can't walk, there's a real risk of being walked on 
by the other birds which are there. In other words, it's trampled to death. I buy and eat a lot of chicken, and I'd think twice about it now after seeing this. Outside the chicken sheds, the charmingly named dead bins. I've got to show you inside this dead bin in a minute. I've just looked in here and uh, you're not going to uh, believe what's inside it. I mean, this is utterly, utterly repulsive. Look, it's crawling with maggots. And you can't tell me this is following guidelines. No, of course, the, what they're supposed to do is to get rid of these birds, take them away from the place where they might be passing on infection to the, to the, to the living birds. How, how long is it before maggots appear when something's thrown in? Uh, probably four or five days. So those have been in there for four or five days. Where should they be? They sh surely it shouldn't no, they be should allowed be taken, to get to that. They, should, uh, they, they could be put into a freezer or they could be taken to a proper disposal place. Uh, and uh, you can actually tell how long exactly they've been there by looking at the developmental stage of those maggots. And is that not grounds for prosecution? Not for the welfare of those birds, but it would contravene the codes of practice uh, to not to take these birds away because it will put the other birds at risk. But, I mean, the smell must be appalling. Dead bins like this are a frightening example of how bad things can get. But according to Professor Broom, the conditions inside these sheds are anything but rare. Well, what we're seeing here is a, is a chicken production unit which is not atypical. Uh, most of the birds are walking around, a few of them are severely affected. Uh, it, this isn't uh, very different from what happens in other chicken production units. So this is the reality of, of the chickens that we see on our supermarket shelves? Yes, it is. Yes, this is, these are the conditions in which the birds live. Ironically, on the office wall, an out-of-date certificate shows that four years ago, this farm satisfied the requirements of the assured chicken production standards for chicken for human consumption. So who's responsible for these appalling conditions? Alongside that certificate are a number of documents showing that this farm supplies chickens to Grampian Country Foods. Their chickens are on the shelves of all Britain's big four supermarkets. We asked Grampian if they were aware of these conditions and what they were doing about it. Grampian Country Food Group takes the welfare of its chicken flocks very seriously. All of our farms are independently audited by assured chicken production to ensure that they meet all the current regulations and legislation covering chicken welfare. We are confident that our welfare policies and procedures continue to be in place on the farm in question and cannot make any further comment on the allegations being made without viewing the footage. You would hope that conditions like these are rare, but Professor Broom says that the state of the birds here is symptomatic of more widespread problems. What we've done in breeding uh, chickens for meat production over, over the last 30 or 40 years is to cause them to develop faster and faster. So birds uh, actually are reaching a weight of two kilograms uh, in 35 to 40 days now, whereas 30 years ago it would have been 75 to 80 days. Therefore the, the leg development has not quite, hasn't kept pace with the body development. So we have a situation where a, a, a bird has legs of a five week old bird and essentially the body of a 12 or 15 week old bird and they can't support that body very well. And the consequence of it is that you have damage to the tissue which means there's pain in the joints and overall the bird is not able to stand up and walk around as it needs to do. Back in his kitchen, Raymond Blanc is ideally qualified to perform a chicken autopsy. To me, this chicken represents, if we can call it a chicken, represents all the ills of the food chains. How can you buy a £2.15 chicken? That chicken has the worst possible life. Look at that, it's totally unnatural to have that kind of sickness of breast. I don't want to touch it. I have to touch it today. But OK, let's take it out of his misery, poor little beast. I want to show you a few things, OK? Look at that. 
The older bone is very spongy. There is no calcium whatsoever. Of course, because that chicken has been grown between 40 and 50 days. That chicken, 120 days. Okay, look how thick the legs are. Why? Because that chicken has never run in his life. <laughs> this poor, poor little chap, okay, fed so it goes as fast as possible and as big as possible. Never mind the taste, never mind the texture, because it's an irrelevance. Okay, so you can see here, look at the difference. Okay, all that is spongy, full, full of blood. Okay, the bone is very brittle. Okay, you can see it here if I see. It, it breaks very quickly, very brittle. Look at that. Okay, it's not bone. Okay, it is sponge. Okay, so and that one. Okay, so look at the structure of that bone. Okay, look how opaque it is, how healthy it is, how strong it is. But of course, that chicken has run, had lots of sex, lots of food from the ground. Okay, had a very happy life. So obviously, it's a very different chicken, and of course, that will translate into the flavor as well. Look at that. Also the chicken, look at the color of that meat. Look at the color. Immediately, you can see, okay, the color is so, so, so different. So, want to make sure you don't buy one of those chickens that can't support their own weight? Well, I've got a clue for you. One that we can all look out for in the supermarket. Something that tells us about the conditions in which a chicken has been reared. It's called a hock burn. A hock burn is a form of dermatitis uh, which, which affects the uh, layers of skin on uh, a chicken and uh, it is uh, something which is caused by the ammonia which is in the litter that the birds will be sitting on or crouching on. And ammonia burns skin and that will affect several layers of skin and may be followed by ulceration. And that would be painful to the chickens because they have pain receptors in the skin, just as we do. But just how many of these lame, overgrown chickens are making it into the supermarkets? The study which uh, Nadine Reifman and I carried out in Cambridge involved going to uh, 11 different supermarkets and looking at uh, 384 birds. And what we found was that 82% uh, uh, of the birds had some degree of hock burn, and these uh, levels were rather a lot higher than we'd thought. Don Broom's study has just been published. It's a shocking indictment of the industry, but it's based on chickens bought some time ago. We wanted to check for ourselves that they were on sale right now in supermarkets. So Professor Broom agreed to go on a hock burn hunt, this time with a secret camera following his movements. <music> Professor Broom went shopping in the Cambridge branch of each of the big four supermarkets. It wasn't long before he found the first chicken with a hock burn, a telltale brown mark on the rounded, scaly part of the leg. There's an obvious hock burn there. More on one leg than the other. And as he continued his buying spree, Professor Broom had no trouble finding them. They were in every supermarket he went to. The, the damage to the tissue in what, with a hot burn of this size would go down several millimetres into the tissue. So that, so that would be quite, it would be quite painful, something like that. He even found chickens where the hot burn had been carefully removed before the bird was packed. You can see the hot burn area, even though the scales have been removed there, mm. you can see that the tissue underneath the scales is, is damaged by the hot burn. After several hours of intense shopping, Professor Broom had struck unlucky in all of the big four supermarkets. On this bird here, this is a fairly severe uh, hock burn, at least for a grade A chicken. Now on this bird, you can see that there is a small area of hock burn there, a, a, a medium size there, and then there's an area where the scales are missing. There might well have been a more extensive hock burn there. 
And then on this bird here, you can see the, the tail end, the parson's nose, has a lot of red coloration on it. That uh, area there would, would be the result of uh, contact with, with the litter and some sort of friction on the litter for this bird during the time that it's in the house. I think people don't realise that they actually can just look at the bird in the supermarket and they can see these, these brown marks on the legs. Anybody can do this and can decide whether or not to purchase the bird. The Supermarkets Trade Association, the British Retail Consortium, told us... Supermarkets take the issue of animal welfare extremely seriously and it is a fundamental requirement of their suppliers. They added that animal welfare is... ..controlled through strict production standards, one of which is assured chicken production. Any breaches in these standards are unacceptable and are always taken up with the producer. This chick has a disease called coccidiosis. It's a bacterial infection of the gut which can sweep through a flock of chickens in no time. It causes loss of appetite and diarrhea. Birds with coccidiosis pass droppings containing tiny little spores called oocysts. And if, in the cramped conditions of the broiler house, birds start to peck at those droppings, the whole flock can soon be infected. But responsible chicken farmers like Alan Simpson take preventative measures by giving the birds feed containing special drugs called coccidiostats. They've been doing it for years. Trouble is, not much is known about the effect of coccidiostats on people. So, to be safe, farmers are required to withdraw them from the birds' feed several days before slaughter. But organic farming pressure group, the Soil Association, are worried that there may be some left when they're plucked, filleted and whisked off to the shelves. We decided to put the supermarket's cheap chicken to the test. We went to all four major supermarkets and brought frozen chickens in each. And some chicken livers too, because that's where the coccidiostats are most likely to be found. We sent them to a top research lab in Germany to be tested for any sign of coccidiostat residue. This is what they found. There were traces in 37 of our 40 supermarket samples. No problem there, though, because the amounts we found are well within the government's acceptable limit of 200 micrograms per kilogram of meat. But all our chickens had the same coccidiostat in them. It's called nicarbazin, and it's the subject of a bit of a Euro scrap. Dr Vivian Howard is one of the country's leading toxicologists. With respect to nicarbazin, this has been looked at by the EU in their FEDAP committee. And once again, they've, they've come up uh, with a report which says there isn't enough information there for them to make a decision about the mutagenicity, so that's the, the, the ability of this, com this uh, medicine or, or drug to actually um, cause damage to DNA. And so they, in the absence of that information, they are saying that they can't, um, they can't set a maximum residue level. In other words, they can't decide whether nicarbazin is definitely safe at any level. And what that means is that whilst here in the UK, the residue levels we found were well within the government's acceptable limits, some experts think there's good reason to be extra careful. I think we, we can be fairly certain that if you're eating chicken from broiler houses, uh, you will be getting a level of exposure to this compound. Now, of course, the regulators will say, but it's underneath the maximum residue level, therefore it's safe. But I think that uh, really, the, particularly with respect to infants and the fetus, we should be minimising exposure. Now, it's not just me, is it? These bigger, grow-faster chickens do seem to produce an awful lot of fat when they're cooked in the pan. 
So is the modern way of eating breeding not just obese children, but obese chickens too? Well, there's only one way to find out. Liposuction. This is the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition at London Metropolitan University. We've brought along a chicken from each of the big four supermarkets, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's and Asda, so the boffins here can find out what they're made of. They're going to start by extracting all the fat to see if these cheap chickens are just obese couch potatoes. First step, into the blender. The necessary chemicals are standing by. The whole chicken has to be reduced to a pink goo. Then add some solvent and the long process of extracting the fat is underway. A week later, the tests are all complete and I'm back at the Institute to meet with Michael Crawford. No, not that one, Dr. Michael Crawford. He's the man who supervised the tests for us and apparently he's got some startling results. Well, this is a, a, uh, uh, the fat out of, of one single chicken, and that was about 17% um, fat. That's almost a pint of fat from one chicken. I'm horrified by this. Basically, they were all the same. I eat a lot of chicken. Right. Because I think it's low in fat. Well, it isn't. And that's, that's the... just out of one chicken. I mean, what, what, what effectively you're getting here, the big problem is that, that you're getting, uh, in terms of the calorie value, more calories coming from fat than protein. And what this means is, th is that the public thinks they're buying a protein-rich food. Mm. In fact, they're buying a fat-rich food. And in 1976, the Royal College of Physicians, British Cardiac Society said in their report on coronary heart disease, if you want to avoid heart disease, eat less fatty red meat and choose chicken because it's low in fat. Hmm. And that's And it stuck. used to be the case. We all... We well, all it was the case. It was the case that, that chickens provided more protein than fat. Now it's the other way around. Chickens didn't always used to have this much no, fat No, of course it didn't. Did they? Course so it why didn't. do they now? What happens is, is that if you uh, feed the animal on a high energy diet and if it doesn't get any exercise, it does put on weight, and the weight that it puts on, a large part of that is fat. So this extra fatty chicken that we're all buying, I think we buy 850 million of them a year now. <laughs> this yeah. extra fatty one has, in a way, been created yeah. yes. by the demand of the supermarkets. Yes. They provide a very cheap form of protein for families that don't necessarily have a lot of money. Yeah, and the problem is that the, exactly the people that you're talking about who don't have much money to spend on food, they're exactly the people who are now suffering from obesity, diabetes, heart disease and stroke. But there's more bad news. Even the type of fat is wrong. There are two families of essential fatty acids, both of which you need in a proper balance, the omega-6 and the omega-3. And because of the intensive rearing of animals, what has happened is that the balance between these two families has got completely out of sync. Uh, the omega-3 fatty acids that's important for the brain uh, was, in the 1970s, uh, knocking at the levels of about 170 milligrams per 100 grams of food. There's only 20 in these. So it, it's, it's been sliced sevenfold. But the interesting thing is that people at the National Institutes of Health in, 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 in the United States, Joe Hibble in particular, is now blaming the um, rise in mental ill health amongst young people uh, on precisely the shift in the ratio of the balance between these fatty acids. So cheap chicken is fatter than it used to be, but the British Retail Consortium insist that... Chicken meat remains a nutritious part of the British diet and complies with all UK and European regulations. At least roast chicken isn't in a box, yet more and more of what we're being sold these days is just that. Over the last decade or so, it's the aisle that's grown like a broiler bird. Welcome to the world of the supermarket ready meal. That to me, that's a crime against humanity. Help 
noticing that the supermarket shelves are increasingly full of pre-cooked this, partially roasted that, generally complete meals that you can just pop into your oven or microwave, and hey presto. Yes, the ready meal is taking over the aisles. Mission Control at one of the most successful ready meal companies in the world. You'll find their curries in supermarkets up and down the high street. And this is Sagu Lam Noon. Churning out ready meals has lifted him into the Sunday Times rich list. He's made 50 million from them. But according to him, the person who really benefits is the harassed housewife. It has actually broken the shackles of the housewife from the kitchen. The housewife can go to work, and now today, and most important thing is that it is a safe product to eat. This is food as industrial process. High quality ingredients, additive free, and all the latest machinery. Any factories which produces the ready meals in this country, A, the factories are brilliant. In terms of the microbiologies are checked, and the super services, super machinery, etc. And they are absolutely not only delicious, but they are safe to eat. Because it is, uh, the ready meals are actually made in the environment, which is a unique environment nowadays. It's completely aseptic factories are there. Noons were one of the first out of the blocks, but pretty soon all the supermarkets were onto the ready meals bandwagon themselves. But more doesn't necessarily mean better. When you look at the label on the back of, on the back of a ready meal, um, the vast majority of them are made with what's cheapest for manufacturers to use. And the quality is often really poor. You're paying for extra additives, you're paying for added water, huge amounts of sugar and salt. Lamb casserole will, be, will have kind of 10 different types of sugar on the back. Well, what's that doing there? It's because, it, it's because they're not real ingredients giving real flavour. But that is added value food and that's very profitable for them. I'd really rather not eat them. It's a market that's grown by more than 60% in the last 10 years or so, almost as much as the claims for their products. Take this Sainsbury's Taste the Difference Moroccan chicken with apricots and pine nuts. Pairing sweet fruit with spices in the time-honoured Moroccan style gives this dish the exotic warming flavours of a tagine. I think supermarkets have, in Britain have really grown by exploiting the gap, that, that knowledge gap between the food producer and the consumer. Uh, and that's where they've made their money. And uh, they've, they've succeeded because we know so little about food, we don't know any better. So if someone says to us something that is blatantly ridiculous like, um, here is a ready meal that was cooked in a, in, in, in a factory and trucked all around Britain and it tastes much better than anything that you could cook at home. We actually believe that. Now, most, most Europeans would say, come off it, you've got to be joking, it won't, it can't. We asked Raymond Blanc to try a typical supermarket ready meal, Boeuf Bourguignon from Asda. Voilà, OK, that, that Boeuf Bourguignon is a very, very strong colour. Let's have a that smell of it. Yeah, you, go, you go for it. Oh, my God. Very that, to me, is a crime against humanity. It's a crime against food. When I came in the 70s in England, yes, that's what I would do. But now, you don't expect. Oh, it's horrendous. It's absolutely, it's jammy, it's messy, it's, it's chemical. You can feel the chemicals right the way through, you know? It's, um, well. Just take one each. So Raymond would clearly have no problem spotting a ready meal, but would our average shoppers be able to? It's done food, it? After a little persuasion, he agreed to knock up a birth bourguignon of his own to see if they could tell the difference. Now I'm going to mix those two together. Wow, look at that. Then the one, wow. Mm. 
Well, Raymond's obviously very keen on healthy ingredients, and so are the supermarkets, because their product planners have discovered that health sells. Combine convenience and health in the same packet, and you've got a supermarket Shangri-La. And now they're all over the place. Healthy living, be good to yourself, eat smart, good for you. Each of the big four has its healthy, ready meal range. But just how good for you are they? We asked Staffordshire Trading Standards to check out some of the claims. In most cases, the um, healthier option type styled product did contain less fat than the standard product. And that's, that's a good thing and that's what we'd expect. Um, but in some cases, it would contain the same amount of fat as the standard product, and in, and in, in, one, in one, one or two cases, it actually contained more. Take these chicken dippers from Sainsbury's Blue Parrot range for children. They actually have more fat per 100 grams than the equivalent adult product. And this good-for-you lasagna from Asda has less fat than Asda's ordinary lasagna. But that's because it's got less meat. It's just 14% meat instead of 23%. That's one way of cutting down your fat intake, I suppose. These healthy meals seem to have plenty of helpful nutritional information on the packets, but you need to know what it all means. Take salt, for example. It's not universally true that if you buy a healthy option meal, you necessarily get a reduced salt meal. We have here a healthy living um, jambalaya, which claims to be 3% fat, 477 calories, which on analysis found to be true. If you look at the back of the label for the full information, it, it points out that a serving of this product would, would give me the um, 477 calories, but would also give me 3.8 grams of salt. So if I, as a woman with a need of 2,000 calories a day, and targeted not to eat more than six grams of salt a day at this, I would get a quarter of my daily amount of calories, but three quarters of the recommended amount of salt that I could eat in a day. Back in the kitchen, Raymond's boeuf bourguignon is ready for the tasters. Will they spot which is which? I'm gonna bring Raymond in. Okay. I don't fall. I've worked 25 years to get to the Can we look at the sweat, please? Can we look at the sweat here? Let me just ask you, first of all, any sort of thoughts and observations on, on what you tasted? The first one was very intense. The second one, it was just lighter and cleaner tasting. It's more depth to the flavours in it, maybe. OK, well, uh, so you're ready for this, Raymond? You're... Oh, completely. Yeah. I expect always the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Who preferred dish number one? Who preferred dish number two? Well done, guys. Well done. I don't think I need to tell you the answer, do I? <laughs> A very relieved and happy Not really relieved. Asda versus Raymond Blanc. No contest. But can I persuade him to come to my kitchen to cook it? Next week on Supermarket Secrets. Ducks in distress. Why the Spanish prefer ugly tomatoes and the dairy cows bred to produce up to 120 pints of milk every day. Monday night at 8 for part 2 of this Dispatches special. Well, next up, an ambassador's ball and a double-crossing secret agent, Very 007, in an extended Big Brother. <laughs> 